This video provides a brief introduction to Windows Presentation Foundation development using Oxygen for .NET. Windows Presentation Foundation, or WPF, is the successor to WinForms and Win32 for all Windows user interface design. As such, it has been built into Windows since Vista, and downloads are available for older versions of Windows, including XP. Instead of GDI, it makes use of DirectX for both raster and vector graphics. This results in high performance user interfaces in both 2D and 3D rendering. It also provides for improved typography through a number of features that greatly enhance the readability of text on the screen. From an architectural point of view, WPF makes use of XAML for the user interface definition. This provides for a strong separation of the user interface design from the programming logic. This allows for designers to focus on the user interface while programmers build the logic on the back end. It also supports advanced data binding, templates, themes, and styles, comprehensive media services, and graphic effects, animations, and transitions. Let's take a look at creating a WPF application and the templates that are included in Oxygen for .NET. There are two different templates that come with Oxygen for .NET for WPF application development. The WPF user control library template provides you with a way to create reusable visual controls and the code that goes with them. Simply create one of these projects, add the controls and the code that you need in there, and then you can reuse that in your WPF application. The WPF Windows application template is the template you'll use to create your WPF applications. Let's go ahead and do that now. The template will present you with this blank project here. You'll have this blank window, which is the design service which you can design your main user interface for your application. Over here you see we have the window1.xaml file selected. This is the XAML file that defines this user interface. Associated with that is the window1.xaml.pass. This is the code that provides the functionality for your user interface. You also see we have an app.xaml file. This file contains XAML resources that can be available to your entire application. It also has an app.xaml.pass, which is the class that defines the main object of your application. This is the object that will instantiate the other windows in your application. So let's go ahead and create a simple application here. We'll put down a text box, a button, and a text block. And you can think of a text block as a very simple label. So now by default, these controls don't have a name. But if you want to interact with them, they need a name. So I'm going to go ahead and call this text out. And this one, text in. And now I'm going to add a click event handler on my button, which I can do a number of different ways. But I'm going to go ahead and here to the property inspector. And now we're in the pass file where we can add our code. We'll just say text out dot text equals text in dot text. And we're ready to run our application. And here we're presented with the user interface. And we can simply add some text in here and click the button and it moves the text over there. Very simple application. I'm going to show you something that's cool about XAML that makes this even easier to do. I'm going to go ahead and take this code out of here. And in here I'm going to add some data binding on the text block. So in here, the text, I'm going to add this um, data binding in order to bind it to the text in controls text property. And so now I'll go ahead and run this. So now I no longer need to click the button 
as soon as I make a change in here, it's automatically reflected in the text block. So that's a really quick sample of what you can do with data binding in WPF applications. Now we will look at some of the specific tools you will find helpful in your WPF application development. So the toolbox is available over here, and this contains all the components that you can drag from here, as you already saw me, onto the design surface. You can also drag these from here into the XAML code window down below. So it's important to note that the XAML code and the design surface are kept in sync. Any changes I make down here are automatically reflected up above. So if I can delete the checkbox I just added, and it's gone, I can change the text in my text box to, and it's updated. Now you may also notice it's updated here in the property window at the same time. All three of these are kept in sync, and you can edit it in whichever method is easiest for you or makes most sense based on what you're currently doing. The document outline is usually available over here as well, and what it provides is a hierarchical view of the elements within your application. So in this case, we don't have very many elements nested here, but you can see that we have a window, which is the top level element here. So window contains a grid which contains the text in, the button, and the text out. As you get more complex user interfaces, this document outline provides a very convenient way of seeing how your elements are laid out, which elements are parented where, and selecting those various parented elements. You can also hide elements or lock them to prevent them from being edited. Some of the key concepts you want to take advantage of in your WPF development includes layouts, data binding, and templates. Let me show you these in action. There's a number of different layout options available in WPF. The default one you get with a new project is the grid layout, which allows for rows and columns that you can define and then assign components to those roles or columns. The one that we're probably most used to if you come from a background in Win32 development is called the canvas, where you specify things with an X and a Y. I'm going to go ahead and show you one called the stack panel, which is probably the most useful one. Now the stack panel works on the idea of a stack. So everything is stacked in here. You see all of my elements are stacked one through seven in here in this side of the stack panel. And I've nested one stack panel inside another stack panel. And see the second stack panel contains these uh, buttons down here. So we have two stack panels stacked inside a stack panel. You'll see this a lot that you'll be stacking stack panels inside of their stack panels. You also notice that the second stack panel here has an orientation horizontal. And that's because I want the buttons side by side. Now you can change this orientation to vertical. And now my buttons are above each other. Now, if you want to change how your controls are spaced, you can do that through the modification of the margin property here. So I'm going to go ahead and mar change the margin on all of my elements here. And so if I give them a margin of 5, then that's going to put a margin 5 all the way around those elements. If I do 5, 1, that's going to do a margin of 5 on the left and right and 1 on the top and bottom. And I can go further by saying comma, um, 1, comma, 5, and then that will put a margin of 5 on the left and bottom and 1 on the top and right. So very flexible in how you can define these margins. Uh, let's go ahead and leave it at 5 for now. And then you can also put space inside of the element. So between the uh, where the tip between the text and the edge of the colored area through the padding and the same thing applies here you can just put any values you want in there to change the way that's going to be laid out so I'm gonna go ahead and run this program the flip button will modify the orientation of this stack panel here so you can see how that behaves and then also something else I want to show you that's really great about stack panels 
So I'll go ahead and hit flip on this and you can see how it can dynamically reposition all these controls and everything else just flows together in order to adjust the layout as you need it for when you change that orientation. Now something else I've done is I've added a event on these each element. So if I click on an element, it collapses the element, removing it from the layout. So you'll notice when I click on the green element four here, it goes away and everything just moves up to fill up that space. So stack panels are great for dynamic user interfaces where you want to have things maybe that are there, sometimes they're not there other times based on different configurations. So I'll show you the code for this really quick. All we do is set the visibility to visibility collapsed. So there's three visibility options. There's visibility visible, visibility hidden, and visibility collapsed. When it's hidden, you can't see it, but it still takes up space. Collapsed means it no longer takes up space. So that's a quick introduction to stack panels, which I'm sure you'll find very useful, especially if you consider situations where you want to have, for example, a label next to an edit box or a button next to an edit box or something like that. So I'm going to show you more about data binding as well as templates here in this, in this application. First of all, this is a list box here. But this list box has a template assigned to it. So if I remove this here, and the extra quote, we'll see that it goes back and looks like a regular list box. So the, temp the, uh, the template that we've assigned to it here changes the way it looks. So if we can actually go up here and we can see the in the Windows resources, we define a template called list template that has various characteristics assigned to it. So we can modify the, the appearance of this through this template. You can reuse this template on multiple elements on the same window. Now, if we want to use the same template on multiple windows, then you take this out of the window resources and you put it up here in your app.xml file and make it available as an application resource. So also when this application runs, we have a template defined for how the controls are going the data is going to appear in this list view. And that is this cool format data template. So down here on art we see we have an item template, which is our cool format, and our template. So this is what's going to define how each individual item looks, and this template is defined applied to the entire control as a whole. In our code, all we're simply doing is initializing our person data and assigning it to the item source of the list view. And that's all the code that's necessary. And I'll go ahead and show you how this works. So we see here we have each person, their age, and their color is displayed here in this element on the side. This white, of course, is kind of hard to see. But all this layout inside of this list view is accomplished through the template. So there was no need to define some sort of complex uh, descendant of the list view that has some sort of specific type of element inside of it and do custom drawing all that stuff. It's all built into the WPF. So I'll show you the code for the data template here. So all we do is we're adding a margin around it and then we put a grid, a grid layout inside of it. And the grid has uh, two rows and two columns. And inside that grid, we're adding a text block in row zero, column zero, and we bind that to the full name, and a rectangle in row zero, column one, that spans two rows, and we bind that to the favorite color, and then a text block in row one, column zero, for the age. Very simple way of just declaring what you want it to look like, and there you go, you don't have to have lots of different custom controls or things like that. Very easy to do with templates in WPF. Now we'll take a moment to look behind the scenes. When it comes to compiling, the XAML and Pascal files are treated differently by the two different stages of the compiler. The first stage just compiles the XAML file into a tokenized binary application markup language file and a g.pass file. At this point, the g.pass file and the original pass file form what is called a partial class, which is a single class that is defined over multiple source files. 
The second stage of the compilation compiles all these files down into your program, and the BAML file is included as a resource within the program, and it is ready for deployment. Let's take a look at what this looks like in your application. Quickly, I'll show you how partial classes work. You notice here our window one class is declared as a partial class. So that means that other class files may exist. So this class may be defined in other source files. Now down here, you'll see I have a list people, which is defined in my XAML as one of my controls on my form. But if we look here in our declaration, we don't see that declared anywhere. And the answer is it's declared in our G file. So if I go to definition, we'll see here we jump over here and here is list people as well as all the other controls that I have declared. So the g.pass file you can see it is stored in the obj debug folder. So when you build, that's where the stage one build results go. And so these two partial class files together form the window one file. Partial classes are a very powerful feature of the Oxygen for .NET programming language that allows your class to exist across one or more files. To learn more about WPF development with Oxygen for .NET, please visit wiki.oxygenlanguage.com forward slash en slash WPF.